Hi, I'm Roger Copeland, pastor of Northern Hills Baptist Church. Who is Northern Hills Baptist Church? We are you. We are everyday people who love our families, who are seeking direction in life. We are teachers, doctors, bankers. We are your next door neighbor. We want you to be a part of these exciting times at Northern Hills Baptist Church. Take God's Word, please, and open it to the book of James, chapter 1. The book of James, chapter 1. For the next 18 weeks or so, we're going to be journeying through the book of James. James is one of those books that speaks to us so practically. He will answer some questions that we have about life and the trials and the tribulations of life. James answers those questions in this book. Let me say just a word or two about James, the author of the book. There are at least four different people in the, in the New Testament who are called James, whose name is James. It is believed that this James was James, the brother of our Lord. It is amazing to me that James does not refer to himself as James, the half-brother of the Lord, but instead he refers to himself in verse 1 as James, the servant of the Lord. There is a note of humility. There is a note of uh, obscurity uh, on the part of James deliberately that he is not identified uh, as the half-brother of the Lord, but rather he says, I am the servant of the Lord. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that the enemies of the cross, those who were opposed to the spread of Christianity, took James, the half-brother of our Lord, to the pinnacle of the temple and they cast him down and the fall did not kill him and so they beat him to death there on the streets at the temple compound. Eusebius the historian said that James was called James the just because he was a man of piety. He was a man of deep abiding spirituality. If you were looking for James and could not find him the most obvious place you would find him would be in the temple. And it would be there in the temple that James would be on his knees in prayer. In fact, uh, tradition says that James was so often in prayer that he developed calluses on his knees and came to be, uh, and the calluses looked like that of camel's knees. And so he came to be called James Camel Knees. James the Just because of his piety. As I read that, I've got to tell you, I had to pause, I had to think, I had to wonder, I had to muse. What would they say about me? What would they say about you? Would it be Bill the Just? Would it be Susie the Righteous? How would we be referred to? Well, it is this kind of man who writes this book to us to describe for us in the plainest, clearest of terms that when we are going through trials and troubles and tribulations, God has a plan. Since Adam's sin, man has experienced trouble. You don't have to be lost to experience trouble. The Bible says man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. The only thing you have to do in to experience troubles and sorrows and tragedies in this life is to breathe. If you are alive, you're going to have problems. You see, the Bible says that man that is born of woman, that applies to lost people, that applies to saved people, that applies to to spiritual people that applies to carnal people. The fact of the matter is that saved people get cancer. Saved people have heart attacks. Saved people have family crises. Saved people have financial problems. We have the same problems that everybody else has. Being saved does not isolate or insulate you from issues and the problems of life. We are in this world, therefore there will be problems. And yet with the words of the apostles of Paul, may we blend our words with his words and say that we are, we are troubled on every side and yet we are not distressed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair because our hope is not in this world. It is in the world 
to come. The issue that we face is not will our faith be tried. The issue is when will our faith be tried. My faith needs to be tried. I wish it were not so. I wish that I could come to a worship experience like this. And my faith would grow by leaps and bounds. I wish that I could be stirred in uh, in such a way by beautiful, melodious singing that my faith would grow and develop, but it doesn't. I want to tell you, in the fire of trial and adversity, my faith has gone from small to larger. I have an idea today that your faith may need to be tried. That you're comfortable. You're settled down into a state of mediocrity. You're not growing. You're not producing. You're not, you're not developing. You're still where you were when you were saved. And, and you're in that state of infancy and childhood. And, and God says, uh-huh. I love you, and because I love you, I cannot let you stay there. Because I love you, I'm going to push you out of your comfort zone. Because I love you, I'm going to let you feel the flame of the fire. I'm going to let you feel what the cold waters feel like as they rise on your body. Because I want your faith to grow and to be vibrant. I want to move you from a state of infancy to a state of maturity. And the one thing that will do it is trials, tribulations, and adversity. James is writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. These were young Christians. They hadn't been saved long. In fact, it is believed that James is the earliest New Testament book written. It was uh, James died about... uh, Uh, 46, 48 AD. So it was written prior to that. It was written prior to the um, Jerusalem conference in Acts 15. So it is an early book. Christianity was in its embryonic stage. And James is writing to people who have embraced the Christian faith. They have said yes to Jesus. And all of a sudden their world is turned upside down. All of a sudden, their world is filled with insecurities and uncertainties. All of a sudden, their life does not make sense. I want you to see in verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4, these words. Notice, first of all, that, that he mentions the, the word Uh, that he mentions the word in verse 3, count. Circle that word, count. And then in verse 3, he mentions the word knowing. And then in verse 4, he mentions the word let. I want to build our sermon around these three words. In the trying of our faith, when our faith is put to the test, what do you need to know? What do you need to do? When God is trying your faith, number one, you need to look for the right outcome. You need to look for the right outcome. Look what he says in verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers, uh, into divers temptations. You see, you choose how you view the difficulties of life. You choose how you respond to the difficulties of life. When a trial moves into your life, you determine how you view that trial. When there is some uncomfortableness in life, when there is some tragedy in life, when there is a trial of life, you choose how you respond. It's your decision. My feelings are a little bit hurt. By what James says. My flesh wants to rebel against what James said. Because here I am hurting. I'm immersed in fire. There's trial. There's tribulation. There's pain. There's sorrow. And James has the gall to say. Count it all joy. And everything about my flesh rebels against that. How about you? 
Because when life is not fair, joy is not on my mind and in my heart. When I'm suffering only because I'm doing what is right, joy is not what I want to think about at that time. I want revenge. I want to get even. I want to do something. But be joyful is not one of them. James is right. I'm wrong. James is right, and you are wrong. So let's unpack this verse and see what it is that James tells us that we are to do. So we are, we are going through a trial. We, we are in a, in a time of trouble. And what does James say that we are to do? Well, notice in verse 1 that he says, We are to count it all joy. That is a command It is an imperative. It is a present imperative. That means that day in and day out, we are to have this attitude. We are to continually, as a way of life, consider, deem, count it all joy. There is attached to this verb a sense of urgency about it. Can I just tell you what I believe about that sense of urgency? That if you do not immediately begin to find joy in the midst of the trial and the tribulation, Satan will seek to it that you find bitterness. Satan will seek to it that you find anger. Satan will seek to it that you find a negative, caustic attitude. So with a sense of urgency, James says, this trial is upon you. God has allowed it through his permissive will. There is a trying of your faith. And immediately, with a sense of urgency, you are to begin counting it all joy. I know what you're thinking. Impossible. Impossible. When you are going through a trial, when you're going through a tribulation, it is impossible to count it all joy. You, can, you, you might even be willing to say, you know what, preacher, I don't believe that. I don't believe there's anybody that has ever done that. You can't show me anybody that has ever done that. Well, first of all, let me just suggest this to you. It doesn't matter whether I can show you anybody that's ever done that or not. God commanded us to do it. We're duty bound by God to do it. But I can show you an example of somebody that did it. Thanks for asking. The apostles had been commanded not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. By the way, have you ever noticed how this world cannot stand the name of Jesus? What's the problem with the name of Jesus? I'm going to preach a little bit right here. The only, thing, the, the only problem with the name of Jesus is that when the name of Jesus is invoked, dead men come back to life. Eyes that were blind began to see. The name of Jesus, limbs that were broken are restored. The name of Jesus, when he is mentioned, for sinners are forgiven, lives are transformed. And yet this world says, don't, don't preach in the name of Jesus. Mm. Well, they said, don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And the apostles said, we cannot help. We cannot help but preach those things that we have both seen and heard. And they continued to preach in the name of Jesus. And they beat the backs of the disciples. And they were rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Can I suggest this to you? When we have a difficulty in rejoicing in the midst of our tribulation and our trial. See, see, the, the world says you know what, if, if that's what being a Christian is, I don't want anything about it. I don't want anything to do with it. If, if trial and trouble comes into your life and you've got to rejoice, that's not me. I don't want that. Well, can I just say to you, if you don't know Jesus, you can't rejoice. If you don't know Jesus, you have nothing about which to rejoice. So don't talk about something you don't know anything about. We who are saved have the capacity And the ability to rejoice in the midst of our circumstances. Not because our circumstances are good. Not because the trial is pain free. But because our Savior is a wonderful Savior to me. We can rejoice in any circumstance, in any trial, in any tribulation. Because Jesus is good. I love the words of Warren Wiersbe. He hit the nail on the head when he said, our values determine our evaluations. 
Now I want you to think about that for just a minute. Our values, what we value, that will determine our evaluations. Our values determine our evaluations. And then he continued. If we, if we value comfort more than character, there will be no joy. If we value the material more than the spiritual, there will be no joy. If we value time over eternity, there will be no joy. If we cannot rejoice in our trials, then our values are wrong. I wonder if you'd be willing to admit that today. Maybe you're in a trial, and instead of joy, there's anger. Maybe you're in a trial, and instead of joy, there is uh, accusations toward God. I wonder today if you would be willing to admit, not to me, not to this church, but to the God of heaven, God, I am wrong, and you alone are right. God, your plan is perfect. See, whatever trial you're in, whatever tribulation comes your way, let me assure you of this. That the grace of God is sufficient. The grace of God is sufficient. Now don't say well you know what I don't feel that now. No you don't feel it until you need it. And when you need it you get it. I've told you this story before. I had been down in South Georgia preaching. I was a young preacher. had a young family. (laughs) And I was down in South Georgia preaching. Flew uh, coming home. Flew to the Atlanta airport, got on the airplane, and uh, some ways out of Little Rock, the uh, pilot came on and he said, we're experiencing turbulent weather, we're going to try to fly around the storm, our trip is going to be delayed some. I'm telling you, religion came over that plane like you can't believe. (laughs) Them people drinking them little bitty bottles like that, throwed them away. I spit out my bubble gum, buddy, we got, I'm telling you, we got religion in a hurry. And you know how sometimes you can be flying along and all of a sudden you just drop. And and, 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 uh, you begin to think, I didn't think it'd be this way, but okay, whatever. And you begin to think, oh, what about my little kids? What about the church of pastor? You, be, you begin to wonder, what, what, how's this thing going to end? And you get scared. Well, we eventually came out of that storm, landed safely. And I got to thinking about that. I said, you know, Lord, I'm not happy with the way I responded to that. I got a little bit scared. And I, I've told people, when you come to die, God will give you dying grace. And God said, that's right, but you weren't dying today. <laughs> You don't get grace ahead of time. Oh, I couldn't stand if this happened. I couldn't bear up if it happened. Well, you don't know that because you don't get the grace until you need it. For every trial, there is an abundance of the grace of God. You will never face a trial. You will never face a tribulation. You will never have a sorrow in your heart that the grace of God cannot heal. God's grace is sufficient grace. Praise the name of God for sufficient grace. Well, there's a second thing I want you to see. When trials and tribulations come, you've got to assume the right attitude that this is going to be a time of growth. This is going to be a time of rejoicing. Number two, when trials and tribulations come, you've got to acknowledge the right operation. Look what he says in verse three, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Our faith has to be tested. Our faith gets dirty. Our faith gets weak. Our faith gets contaminated. Our faith gets complacent. Therefore, our faith has to be tested. I wish it were not so, but it is true. Our faith needs to be tested. We require, we require that our faith be tested because uh, left to ourselves, we just don't grow. We don't nurture our faith the way we ought to. So our faith has to be tested. And I want to tell you in this testing process, God's up to something. Are you listening? When God allows your faith to be tested, when God allows tribulations and trials and sorrows and heartaches to be filtered through His grace to come into your life, God is up to something. Can I tell you what God is up to? God is up to making you a mature 
Christian. See what he says in verse 3. He says, he says, this is what it's all about. That the trying of your faith worketh patience. Know this. Know this day in and day out. Know this through personal experience. That the trial of your faith worketh patience. The trying, the testing of your faith produces patience. Let me say a word about patience. I'm not an example on patience. I hate to wait. I don't care what it is for. I hate to wait. I hate to go to the doctor's office for a 2 o'clock appointment and see him at 2.01. I'm there at 10 minutes to 2. See me early. It doesn't work, as you know. I hate to wait. I have zero patience. I have zero tolerance for somebody who says, I'll meet you at 2 o'clock. And they're there at 2.01. If you said you'd meet me at 2 o'clock, meet me at 2 o'clock. Oh, I could give other examples of my hatred for patience. That might explain why mine is tried so often. God is saying, you don't fail the test, you just keep taking it until you pass. (laughs) The trial of your faith. Patience. You know what that word is, though? It's not the ability to wait in a doctor's office without blowing the place up. That's not it. Patience is the ability to abide and remain. The picture is that of bearing a heavy load, having a burden on your shoulders. And instead of setting the burden down, you say, no, I'm going to continue. When your friends say, you know what, you sure do look funny carrying that burden. You going to lay it down? When the world says, you know what, Christians are the only ones that carry burdens that I know of. You going to let it down then? You know what, it would behoove you and it would be the height of intelligence for you to set that burden down. I got news for you, the world does not understand the burdens that Christians bear. And they would say to you, put it down. And God says, I'm trying to develop persistence, patience, steadfastness, stamina in your faith. It's kind of like these runners. They run, they build up their stamina. They run some more, they build up more stamina. They run, they run, they run, they condition, they eat right until they build up stamina and they can run marathons. Marvelous, unbelievable amounts of uh, mileage that, that some people can run because they've, they've conditioned themselves, they, they've developed stamina, and we need that in the Christian life so that when the, when the hard times come, we don't throw in the towel, we do not quit, but instead we have spiritual stamina, and the only way to get it is you've got to bear some heavy burdens from time to time. We're, we're by nature weak. By nature, we, we want to quit early. I teach at a school of preachers, and I've come to this conclusion that an education is the only thing that people are willing to pay for and not get. We're not going to have class tonight. Praise the Lord. (laughs) I'll make them watch this. When you turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11, you know what you find? People that had faith who endured. You know what the Bible says about some of those? They were sawn asunder, but they endured. They looked for a city whose builder and maker was God, but they never found it here on earth, but they endured. You know what faith will do for you? You're going to get your feelings hurt, but you're going to endure. You're going to be misunderstood, but you will endure. You're not going to understand the way the ways of God and why God allows and why God did, but you will endure because you have a strong, vibrant faith. The only way you can do that is there's got to be a trial. There's got to be something that will, that will drive you to God. 
There's got to be an uncomfortableness. There's, there's, there's got to be, there's got to be something that prods you in the direction of God that says you need God. You need God every day of your life. There's got to be something that will say, God, without you, I will surely perish. So God says, I'm going to send a little trouble there. I'm going to send a little trial there. And what it's going to do, it's going to purify your faith. It's going to create spiritual stamina in your life. You won't throw in the towel. You won't quit. You will keep on because I've developed you into a mature man. There's a third thing and last thing I want you to see. And that is not only must we have the right outlook. We must also have the right operation. But then we should expect the right outcome. Here it is in verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work. And when, it, when, you, when you let patience have her perfect work, this is the result. In order that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Let, uh, he says, allow this to happen. Allow this to take place in your life. God is at work. God is, alive. God is trying your faith. Now, you have a responsibility. You see, God does not just uh, do this and the, the end result is automatic. There is something I must do. What I must do is I must allow this work to be done because God has something in mind. And what God has in mind is that on the other side of the fiery furnace, on the other side of the deep water, God has in mind that I would come out looking like Jesus. If God lets you go in a fiery furnace... And you come out looking like Jesus. Are you okay with that? If God lets you go into the deep waters. The chilly waters. But you come out on the other side. Looking like Jesus. Are you okay with that? See he says let patience have her perfect work. That you may be perfect. Not, not that you would be sinless. But that you would be mature. That's what God is wanting to do. God is wanting to get you from babyhood into adolescence into, into adulthood. God is all about maturing you. And one of the tools that God uses in the process of our maturity is trials and tribulations. If you have reared children, did you ever let that child struggle? Or did you ever, or were you one of those parents that did everything for them? Well, you know, if you want to raise a responsible, uh, reasonable child and bring him into adulthood, you got to let him struggle sometimes. You can't do everything for them. Grandkids is a different story. <laughs> but you got to let them struggle. You got to let them have. Uh, Work through some issues on their own. You, 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 you can't do everything for them. And I'm just telling you that our faith will be anemic. It will be mighty, mighty weak if our faith is never tried. The way to maturity is when we respond in faith to the trials of life. He said you'll be perfect, entire, sound, whole, complete, wanting nothing. Lacking nothing. A Puritan preacher said, God had one son without sin, but no sons without suffering. Jesus, sinless. Jesus and all of us, we know some suffering. We know some sorrow. God had one son without sin. And that one son without sin is the Savior of the world. Amen. He's the one who can save you, forgive you, and set you free. Amen. He's the one son that can make you God's child.